break and she started asking me questions. Edge of the bathroom, I could not get in. Uh, and wait, 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 wait. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. All right. There we go. And I'll even turn on the judge. Um, there are a few announcements, not too major, but some. I'm guessing you're probably not in a first winning term course, are you? Okay. You probably don't know anyone who is either, do you? Okay. Uh, but this is for uh, Vince, in case he is or knows of someone who is. Um, they have just last night opened uh, the... Uh, Mini term one course for Cedar course evaluations. Not for the full term courses, but just the, the first mini term. And since I only have two classes left, it's about time they got this open. So anyway, um, if you, you or someone else you know is in one of those, please ask them to be sure to do the Cedar course evaluations. All right. Uh, we also mark the roll here. Vince is not here yet. And Keystone is. It looks like they probably removed Peyton from the role, so I don't have him on the role anymore. Um, now, the rest of the announcements are more, a little more on the personal side. Well, this first one isn't. Because first mini term is rapidly coming to an end, we have class Thursday and Tuesday, and then after that, second mini term begins the next th Thursday. So it's just a week off. Um, that means midterm is awfully close. But this class is in great shape because both of you have turned in uh, the first test and have done quite well on it. Uh, neither of you turned in your paper yet, but I, I've got a score for you, so that's in good shape. Um, just reminding you, don't forget about the paper uh, and get that in when you can. Uh, some of my other classes, I don't have any scores yet, so I um, encourage them to get scores in because periodically are they're supposed to shortly after midterm ask for midterm progress reports and if you, I don't have a grade you have an F in midterm and you really wouldn't but y'all are in good shape okay so that's that next is my personal schedule I had to go out of town last Friday okay and uh, <laughs> it was a long trip we left at 6 in the morning and got home earlier than I thought we would, but we got home at 3.30, but that was still a nine-and-a-half-hour day, and technically I'm supposed to work four hours on Friday, so I asked my boss if I could have this Friday off too because I had such a long one last time. He said, sure. So I will not be here on camp on the Birmingham West Campus this coming Friday at all, so uh, we'll be out of town. Okay, that's day after tomorrow. Now, next week is a strange, strange week. I've never had one come up this much happening in one week. On Tuesday, I've got a doctor's appointment that I'll be leaving campus about 9 in the morning and hopefully getting back by noon. Can't guarantee it, but hopefully I'll be back by noon. So I'm missing basically two classes. or one class, Part of one class, total of another class, and maybe part of a third class. Uh, but uh, my afternoon class, I'll be able to meet. That's Tuesday. So if you're looking for me in the office between 9 and noon, I'm not. Okay. Then, Thursday of next week, I've got another out-of-town meeting. This is in Tuscaloosa. Um, it's one that I signed up for, but I didn't sign up for the day. They when you're getting ready to retire, they want you to go to a meeting to make sure you understand everything you need to do. They tell you everything they need from you, all that kind of stuff. So you expect, yeah, they encourage you to go to these meetings. Well, I, the closest one to here was Tuscaloosa. So I said, I want to go to Tuscaloosa. They assigned me next Thursday. Same week that I'm missing uh, one class completely and parts of two other classes, on Tuesday and Thursday, so that 
That's a wasted week for one class, totally. Okay, but anyway, I will not be on campus. Now, actually, whatever time they let us go from Tuscaloosa, when I'm coming down the interstate, if I'm here before 6 o'clock, I'll be coming back to campus to take care of whatever I can. So I may be on campus a little bit late in the day on Tuesday, but that's all. On Thursday, but that's all. And then on Friday should be a more normal Friday, except I do have another doctor's appointment, a dermatology appointment, on uh, in the afternoon, and I can't remember what time they put it for. Hopefully it's late enough in the afternoon. I won't miss any office hours before noon. But if they put it at 1230, I'll have to leave a little before 1230 to get there. So anyway, a crazy week, okay? And it's right at the beginning, in the first minute term, beginning of second minute term. So it's totally nuts. All right. Any questions on anything before we get started today? Okay. We're in uh, Chapter 2, First Order Differential Equations, in Section 2.4, Exact Equations. And we did these last time. Now, neither you or Vince were here, so I don't know if you were able to follow it on YouTube video or not, but I suggest you do because that did our exact equations. However, um, <clears throat> if you go back to section 2.3 when we did uh, linear equations, uh, remember you transform the derivative by an integrating factor, multiplying both sides by an integrating factor. The same basic idea is sometimes works for a non-exact differential equation. Now remember what your exact equations, these we write in differential form, and we typically write them like this. Let me get my pen set up. Okay. M of xy dx plus n of xy dy is equal to zero. Okay. Now when you write it that way, remember our test. Our test is to take the partial of m with respect to y, not x, and take the partial of n with respect to x, not y, and see if these two are equal. If they're equal, then that's an exact equation. If they're not equal, it's not an exact equation. But on some of those that are not exact equations, they say sometimes it's possible to find an integrating factor, and we're going to call it the same as we did before, mu of xy, okay, uh, so that you can multiply everything on both sides to get them to be exact, okay? So that's the, the game plan here. So what we would have then, if this is not equal, then we do, we try mu of xy, m of xy, dx, plus mu of xy, n of xy, dy. See if that's equal to, you know, and that is equal to zero, because mu times zero is zero. Uh, and then see if the criterion is met then. If it's the product of those two, the partial of the pot product is equal to the partial of the product of the other, then we'll see if it's exact. Okay? All right. Now, they're mentioning criterion four for exactness. And that's going back to... Oh. That's the partial of M and partial of N. So that's what we've been talking about. I don't know where they were, but okay. For exactness. Equation 8, this equation I just wrote down here, is exact if and only if, I'm going to shorthand this, mu M, the product of mu M, taking the Derivative partial with respect to y is equal to the product of mu n partial with respect to x. If indeed those two are true, then we can go with it. 
Okay? Now, what we're going to do, I'm going to go to a clean screen, and then we're going to come back to this equation. Okay? So, mu m with respect to y equal to mu n with respect to x the partials with respect to y and x, okay? Now, let's take those partials, and that's a product rule, okay? So what would that be? Mu times m sub y plus, say again? Mu, mu sub y times m, right? If that's equal to, Take the partial with respect to x over here, and what do you get? Mu n sub x plus mu sub x n. Okay? If those two are equal. Okay. Now, what we're going to do here is get the mu's together. Because that's what we're going to be solving for. So, uh, let me, doesn't really matter which way we do. Uh, they tend to subtract this, so let's subtract mu m sub y from this side minus mu m sub y from this side. Okay, and let's go on and move the uh, mu, the partials of mu to the other side. So we'll subtract mu sub x in here and subtract mu sub x in there. Okay, so here these go out and those go out. Okay, so what we have here is mu sub y m minus mu sub x n is equal to mu times n sub x minus m sub y. Right? Okay, now, your m, your n, your m sub y and your n sub x, you can calculate because they, they give you that in the problem, okay? They're known functions of x and y. The difficulty here is determining the unknown mu sub x from this, uh, is that we must solve a partial differential equation, okay? And they say this straight-facedly. Since we're not prepared to do that, okay, uh, we make a simplifying assumption. Let's suppose that mu is a function of only one variable, okay? For example, let's just say that mu depends only on x, not on x and y. Okay, so what we were calling mu sub x is just going to be d mu dx because it won't have a y dependence. Okay, and then mu sub y would be zero. If it doesn't have a y dependence, that would be zero. Okay, so let's see what we've got then. Uh, this d mu sub x, d mu dx, would be equal to, now, they, because of the minus sign here, which I think to myself, why did they do it this way? Oh, well, maybe I did it that way, okay? Uh, so let's just reverse everything and make this the minus, that the plus, this the minus, and that the plus, okay? Now we're solving for this. So this will be uh, m sub y minus n sub x over n, because this one is zero. That first term is zero, okay? Now. 
Here we have a quotient that depends on both x and y. Uh, however, the left-hand side only depends on x. Okay? So that's a problem. Okay? If, after all the al algebraic simplifications are made, this quotient turns out to depend solely on x, then uh, this is your first order differential equation. You can either uh, you can determine mu because it's separable as well as being linear, and it follows from this, uh, from section 2, 2, and 2, 3, that the mu sub x, now here they jump a big rabbit here, mu sub x is equal to e to the integral of this thing right here, m sub y minus n sub x over n, just n, dx. Okay? That's from the linear characteristic. That would have been your p of x. And that's what we take the uh, integral of that p of x and then raise it to the e power. So that would be your integrating factor. Okay? Um... So, what if this doesn't work? What if you can't get u to be a function of x alone? What if uh, when you do this manipulation, you don't eliminate your y's? What if either of those doesn't happen? Then you got the wrong u. Then go back and try it the other way, like I had it to begin with and then solve for uh, the mu here, okay? And, and reverse these, and then these will be reversed. Uh, this will be reversed. We'll be dividing by m. And if this thing could be a function of y alone, and this is a function of y alone, and this thing, you're, you lose your y dependence, then you've got the integration. Neither one of them work. Hang it up. You can't use it. Solve that differential equation using exact methods. Okay? So, this would be one case. Um, the other would be, this would be one case. The other would be part, no, derivative of mu mu with respect to y would be n sub x minus m sub y over m. Okay? And if that could be a function of y alone, no x is in it, then your mu sub y, a mu of y, would be e to the integral n sub x minus m sub y over m dx. Okay? And see if that will work. If it does, you're in good shape. Okay? So, what we do, we always try to do our these two and see if they're the same. If they're not the same, then we go to the mu. We've already calculated these because that's first thing we do. So then we subtract these two and divide by that, or subtract them the other way and divide by the other. And if either one of those comes up a function of one variable alone, this of x and that of y, then we're, we're in, the, in the clear, and we can go from there. Okay? So, ready for example four. Actually, example four will do everything we did with the others plus some. Okay. So here's a nonlinear first order differential equation xy dx plus 2x squared plus 3y squared minus 20 
dy is equal to zero. Okay? Now, what's our test? Do you remember? Okay, partial of xy with respect to y would be what? x, okay? And then we do this one, the partial of 2x squared plus 3y squared minus 20 with respect to x would be 4x, uh, let's see. Yeah, 4x. Those two are not equal, are they? Okay. Now, the question is, which way looks like it has the most promise? It seems like to me, since you've got uh, everything in terms of x's here, that maybe we ought to shoot for the d mu dx to be a function of x alone. Okay? Now let's see if that's what they do. Yeah. Wait. No. They do it both ways. Okay? Now we've already done our partial of m, our m sub y and n sub x. This is your m sub y, and this is your n sub x, just to keep it in mind, okay? Well, the things we're considering is m sub y minus n sub x over n. That's the first one, okay? Well, this, of course, is your m. This is your n, okay? Well, let's look at that and see what we get m sub y is x minus n sub x is 4x and your n is 2x squared plus 3y squared minus 20. Okay. Numerator there is minus 3x. The denominator is this mess. I'm not going to write it again. Do you think that's going to come up as a function of x alone? Doesn't look like it. So, using what we already know, let's try it the other way. Uh, n sub x, no, yeah, n sub x minus m sub y over m. And let's see what that gives us. Uh, that would be 3x, positive 3x, because that's 4x minus x. Okay, got that. Divided by m sub y. Well, that's xy. Well, look at that. That is a function of y alone. It's 3 over y. Okay. And what do we do with that? You integrate it. Okay? Integrate 3 over y dy um, I don't need that line there, I don't guess. And what does that give you? Antiderivative of 3 over y. So again, 3 times the log, natural log of y. Perfect. Now remember, we don't do a plus c with that integral. Okay? And since we have that, I don't know if this is a good move yet, but just remember, that could also be written as the log of y cubed. Right? And the reason I say that, what's the next thing we're going to do to it? Say again. Make it the argument for e. And I like this form, so that's going to be e of that, and that would be y cubed. That we're suggesting is our integrating factor mu 
this time of why and why alone. Okay? So, what do we do with it? Say that again? Yeah. Multiply it by our original equation. Okay? Now, since I've got my mu here, I'm going to wipe out everything else. Okay? Is that okay? Uh, so let me erase this because we've already used it and got what we wanted. We won't need that anymore because we've already got what we wanted from that. We won't need this anymore because we got what we wanted there. Or actually that didn't work at all. So we don't mind getting rid of that. Whoa! I just erased what I was trying to say. Okay. Let me write it down here. U of Y is equal to YT. Okay? Now I'll erase it from down here. Alright. So we're going to multiply that, everything on both sides, by YQ. That gives us X, Y to the fourth, DX, plus 2X squared, Y cubed, plus 3Y squared, no, Y fifth. Minus 20y cubed dy is equal to 0. Somehow that doesn't look much better, does it? What's our test now? With y, and that would be 4xy cubed. Okay? And then if we do this one, the partial of that mess with respect to x, what would you get? First term gives you 4xy cubed. And the other two terms just have y's in them, taking the partial with respect to x, is it going to be 0? And sure enough, those are exactly the same. Okay. So, that's just our test to tell you these, this is exact now. That's not solved the problem for us. Okay. So, let's get the test out of the way. Now that we know what our new function is going to be, and let's see if we can solve it. Okay, we've just determined that is an exact differential. That implies there's some function f of xy equal to some constant c that when you take the partial of this f with respect to x, you get this. Partial with respect to y, you get that. So let's start with that. The partial of f of xy with respect to x, okay, what would that be? Well, this is what that is, you know, what we're assuming it is. That's your x, y to the fourth, okay? Now, what we're going to do is write it in differential form, integrate both sides, and this gives us uh, f of xy is equal to, now the partial of that with respect to x, I mean the integral of that with respect to x, dx, uh, that would be x 
squared over 2 times y to the fourth. Okay. Plus, <coughs> sorry <coughs> about the show, some arbitrary function of y. Because you took this with respect to x, so you could have a, a g of y on that. Okay? Just like if this was strictly a function of x, that would be a constant plus c. But since this has some y's in it, but they're treated as a constant here, this could have y's in it too, which you're treating like a constant. Okay? So that's your first proposal for what this f of x equals c is supposed to look like. Well, the next thing we're going to do is take the partial of this with respect to y, okay? And that would be what? Take the partial of this with respect to y, 4 times 1 half would be 2x squared. That doesn't get affected by taking the partial with respect to y, and this would be y cubed. Plus, derivative of this with respect to y. Since that's only a function of y, you don't need a partial with respect to this dy dx. D, d, d is y. Okay. Now, this then should be that part there, okay? Because this should be your partial of f with respect to y. So this should equal 2x squared y cubed plus 3y to the fifth minus 20y cubed, okay? That should be what the partial of f with respect to y is, okay? Well, sure enough, this part is exactly the same, right? And this g prime is a function of y alone. So we'll take that g prime, d g dy is equal to 3y to the fifth minus 20y cubed, and write it in differential form, and integrate both sides of that. And what you get then is y of xy is equal to what's the antiderivative of 3y to the fifth? Yes, y to the sixth over 2 minus 5 y to the fourth. Now, trying to remember, I don't think you have to put a constant in there. Uh, yeah, I don't think uh, you need that, okay? Um, because your constant's going to show up elsewhere, okay? So what is this? Why? This is not your solution. Somehow... Oh, I'm sorry. This is a G here. I've been reading that as a Y. This is your G function. And it's not G of X, Y. It's G. G of Y. That's what was throwing me off. I said, something's not right here. 
that was a g of y. My y's and g's look too much alike. Okay, g of y. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. This is the g. Okay, now, so we take, here's your f of x, y is equal to x squared y to the fourth over 2 plus this g of y, which is y to the sixth over 2 minus 5 y to the fourth. And this f is equal to c. There is your constant. Okay, so this is no longer in the picture here. This is your solution. And that sure enough is what they got. One half, they wrote it differently, one half x squared y to the fourth plus one half, excuse me, y to the sixth minus five y fourth is equal to your constant c. And that's your one parameter solution for that difference. One up there that wasn't exact, but we found the integrating factor that made it exact. No guarantee it's going to have one, but we found one that did. And then we followed through our technique for exact equations, found out uh, what the g was, put that back in the picture, and sure enough got the solution that they got. Okay, that, folks, is the end of 2.4. There is a little remarks at the top of the next page, and uh, they uh, talk about some other text uh, on differential equations study of exact equation precedes that of linear differential equations and then they use the same technique that we just did here to call that the p of x and then the integrated factor. We did the linear first and then compare that with linear with the integrated factor of the other. So it's just a matter of form. But anyway, homework exercises here would include any that are in the back of the book of uh, odd ones between 1 and 19. Uh, any of the odds between, excuse me, in the back of the book that's between 21 and 25. If 27 is back there, do it. If 29 is back there, do it. Any of the odds 31 to 35, if they're available. Ten if my toilet hurts hurting. And then 37. and or 39 okay most of the time the discussion problems are not in the back if you find any that are from 40 on by all means take a good careful look at them okay and then there's an interesting mathematical model there the falling chains problem and i can remember doing that in a couple of different courses Always a fairly challenging setup. Okay. Now we're getting to solutions by substitution. And uh, <clears throat> for some reason, my head is closing up on me. Let me go clear my head uh, and see if I can breathe a little bit better. And I'll be... All right, the next section here is section 2.5. Were there any questions uh, about 2.4? Okay. 2.5, you might say, looks a lot like some of the stuff we've done before. They even almost use similar letters, but not quite. Uh, and these are solutions by substitution, okay? Um, so it says, introduction here, we usually solve a differential equation by recognizing it as a certain type, like separable. Always try to include that first, okay? Linear, exact, so on. 
and then carrying out a procedure consisting of equation-specific mathematical steps, say separating variables, integrating factors, whatever, that yield a solution for the equation. It is not uncommon to be stumped by differential equations. This is a major statement here. It is not uncommon to be stumped by a differential equation because it does not fall into one of the classes of equations you know how to solve. Underline that in spades, okay? That is so true. The substitution procedures that are discussed in this section may be helpful or not, okay? But they could be. So here's the first one, uh, substitutions. Often the first step in solving a differential equation consists of transforming it into another differential equation by means of a substitution. Sort of like, kind of like what we do with integration by substitution. Okay, for example, suppose we wish to transform the first order differential equation dy dx is equal to some f of xy. Very generic. We don't know what it is or anything like that. By a substitution, um, and the substitution might be y is equal to some g of x and u. Okay? Now, this can, again, almost seem like you're running around in a circle. You say, okay, what's the point here? The dy dx function of x and y you can't seem to solve it. Well, see if we can come up with something by substituting for y some other function g that also depends on x, but maybe some other variable u, okay? Um, where u is regarded as a function of the variable x as well, okay? So in other words, we swap the y for a g that is... Uh, a function of x, but also a function of u, but u is also a function of x, okay? So you think, well, isn't that just one function of x? Kind of, okay? We'll see. If g possesses first partial derivatives, then this is true, okay? This dy dx that we had before is equal to um, and they kind of lost the F here and I, it, that kind of bugs me they're going straight for the uh, for the, the Y's and the G's here partial of G with respect to X times DX dx. Well, that's just 1, okay? Plus the partial of uh, g with respect to u times du dx. Remember, we're assuming u is some function of x alone, okay? That was our assumption here, okay? Now, and again, the Writing this in a different way, uh, dy dx is equal to g sub x, that's partial of g with respect to x, times 1. And they're writing this now, reminding you it is a function of x and u, plus partial of g with respect to u times u prime, du dx. Uh, uh, we, we prime that. Now, okay. Now, what they're going to do here is, and it almost seems like, okay, you got three expressions for dy dx here. If we replace two of those, uh, um, let's go back to this 
Let's replace this one by what we have here. Okay? Um, and then replace this by your g of xy. Okay? I mean xu, g of xu. Okay? Um, So this equation up here, what we started with, becomes, so we're going to use this for the left-hand side, g sub x as a function of x and u plus g sub u also as a function of x and u, u, not y, du dx, okay, is equal to, that's the left-hand side. The right-hand side, we're going to write as f of x, comma, g of x and u, okay, because that's what your y was, okay. Now, it looks like all we're doing is playing around with notation, okay, but, let's solve this for du dx, okay? Well, first thing we're going to do is subtract g sub x of x and u uh, from both sides. Okay? And then we'll divide by g sub u of x and u. All right, that'll get rid of that. So there's your du dx. Okay, now, because that's so big and ugly, they just say, let's call this capital F of x and u. Okay, and it always seems like when they do that, they play some magic on you, okay? If we can determine a solution for this equation that is u is equal to phi of x, okay? u is equal to some phi of x, just some function of x, and that's what we said before, just some function of x, phi of x, of the last equation, then a solution of the original differential equation is y is equal to g of x, and then since u is phi of x, we won't put u anymore, but put phi of x. Okay. Now, stopping there, okay. Don't come back to this later, but whether you remember it was what we were talking about or not, it'll, it'll still all work out. We're going to look at three um, different kinds of first order different equations that we could be solvable by this kind of a substitution or something relatively close. And the first of these, and here is a place where I wish they had some better term for it, okay? We're going to talk about, and I don't know how you pronounce it, homogeneous equations or homogeneous equations, however you want to pronounce that. Um, and they're also said to be homogeneous or homogeneous functions. Later, we're going to talk about homogeneous systems or homogeneous systems that are different, mean something completely different, okay? But we're going to use the same word for the two of these, so see if you can figure it out, okay? Here, a function f, if a function f possesses this property, 
f of, and this is a weird way to express it, t of x, t of y is equal to some t sub alpha of f of x, y. Now, I look at that and say, what in the world are you talking about? Okay, for some real number alpha, okay, some real number alpha, then f is said to be homogeneous. Okay, and that to me leaves a lot to be desired until they give the example. Here's an example. F of xy is equal to x cubed plus y cubed. Okay, that's homogeneous. Why is it homogeneous? Why didn't they just say this to begin with? each term has the same degree. That would be so much easier to say than that mess up there, okay? It just seems like, why don't you say each term has the same degree, okay? But they're going to pursue this, and let's say if that's true, then f of tx ty would be tx cubed plus ty cubed, which would be t cubed times some function of, uh, well, let me not skip a step here, of x cubed plus y cubed, which would be t cubed of f of x, y. Okay? Sure, that's true, but guess what? So much easier to say they have the same degree. I mean, why muck it up with this? But I guess that's formal definition. Okay? Um, and there's your alpha is 3 in this case. Now, how about this one? Alpha of x, y equal x cubed plus y cubed plus 1. Is that homogeneous? No, because that last term has degree 0. It doesn't have degree 3. First two terms are degree 3, third term degree 0, not all the same. So that's not homogeneous, okay? Um, or homogeneous, however you want to say it. So what if you have a first-order differential equation um, of this form? And boy, does this look familiar. I think what I'm going to do is start on a clean page. Okay. M of x, y, dx plus n of x, y, dy equals 0. Boy, that looks like what we're just doing. That's homogeneous if both of the coefficient functions, m and n, are homogeneous functions of the same degree. Okay? Um, and they go through that same t's and, you know, t alphas and stuff like this. Um, Now, here's where things get a little, I guess I ought to write it down. I'm trying to avoid part of this because what really matters is the bottom line, okay? If these are homogeneous, then um, of degree alpha, though we'd never used that degree before. I mean, again, I don't think, okay? We can also write these 
as if both the M and the N are homogeneous of the same degree, then here's what you can wind up doing. Writing trying to see if there's any reason at all to introduce the alpha. I don't think so. The M of XY, okay, you can write that as some function of X to the alpha, though we're not going to use the alpha anymore, so don't sweat it too much times m of 1 u. Okay? Now you look at that and say, where did that come from? Okay? And we're going to do the other one just like it. n of x, y, but again, don't sweat it. I mean, it, it seems like it's something really crucial, but it really isn't. x to the alpha, and remember they both have to have the same alpha. Okay? n of x, y. I'm sorry. n of 1, u. Sorry. Okay. Now, what in the world is the u? Here is the only thing you really have to worry about, okay? U is equal to the ratio of Y to X, okay? Now, if you did it the other way, the M of XY is equal to Y to the alpha, and remember they're the same alphas, then this would be M of V1, and put my hands in here, uh, n of xy is equal y to the same alpha, n of v1, okay? In this case, v was equal to x over y, okay? Now, Another way to write this, which is handier, is y is equal to, oh, I almost did it. I tend to do this a lot. When I'm dealing with u's, having just dealt with mu's, I tend to interchange them. u, x, and this is just simply x is equal to v, y. Those are the ones that we're going to do. Where u and v are new, Dependent variables will reduce the homogeneous equation to a separable first-order differential equation, and you don't have all those, I mean, the, the x's and the y's, I mean, the x's to the alphas, the y's to the alpha, basically drop out, okay? Now, I do believe... They, no, no, they have it right. Okay. Now, here's the tie back to what we were doing before. Let's take this equation up here. Y is equal to mu, ux, not mu x y is equal to ux, okay, and do dy, I'm pretty sure it's dx, isn't it? Yeah, dy, I'm going to write it in differential form, is u dx plus x du, okay?
All right. And um, they carry this on for a little bit longer. And they say, this gives you a differential, uh, a separable equation. Let's just wait and see that it does. And then they carry you on through and show you what a solution. And then they say, at this point, we offer the same advice as in the previous sections. Do not memorize anything here, ex especially the last formula. Rather, work through the procedure each time. That's what we're going to do. We're not going to fiddle with the other. Um, let's just do the same thing for the x just so you'll see it dx is equal to uh, v dy plus y dv okay just like this one was that but again don't sweat it so I'm sorry, I'm skipping some steps here because they write all this out and say, don't remember, don't remember it. <laughs> okay, so I say, I write it all out. So let's go to the example and see what we can do. Oh, we're out of time. I've got to go, so sorry about that. We'll pick up next time with example one. I'm glad you caught me on that. I was just about to ask when we're running out of time, and uh, I just forgot to look. That break in the middle really helped. Okay. Uh, so anyway, we'll pick up there. We didn't do enough new in 2.5 for any homework exercises, but this is a very short section. We'll finish this next time, move on to 2.6, and that's fairly short in pages, but it takes a while to do, and then we'll be through with Chapter 2. But, um, both of you have turned in test one, so we'll be ready for test two. Sounds good. All right, I'm going to go.